Hi, and welcome to The Horn, a podcast from International Crisis Group. I'm Alan Boswell. Today's guest is Ambassador Alexander Rondos. Since 2011, Ambassador Rondos has served as the European Union's Special Representative to the Horn of Africa. Today, we're super pleased to talk through the politics and realities around international pandemic relief for the Horn of Africa. Ambassador, thanks for joining us on the podcast. Pleasure, pleasure. Good morning to you. So, so everyone, of course, in the world is facing this crisis together. Yet, many Africans feel particularly fearful that you know their world partners will abandon them in this time. Do you think the world is moving fast enough to help them? I think we've got to analyze first what's the what's really happening in Africa, uh, and the world has not fully appreciated what's really a double punch that's hit Africa. The economic crisis, the consequences of, of the corona have preceded the impact, the, the health impact. And so the scale of what is affecting Africa is already, is already far greater than what has been, I think, collectively mustered. Is the world moving fast enough? No, it could move faster, but I'm surprised at how quickly it's moved. Let me put it that way already. These big machines, whether it's the international financial institutions, um, I look at my own institution, the European Union, I, I'm astonished at the speed with which decisions are being made to reallocate funds, make funds available. So it's quick by global standards, but is it quick enough to meet the needs? We're going to see in the next two or three weeks. And where do you see most of that assistance uh coming into? Will it be budgetary support, humanitarian relief? Where will be the, the biggest focus? There are two or three areas. Uh, first, it's going to be certainly budgetary relief. Uh, we, we've got two problems in the region. One is government lights going out because of lack of funding uh, and, and revenue. And then secondly, households beginning to lose basic revenue, the loss of remittances, the loss of jobs, there's a, there's a slew of, of, of real, real damage being done at the household level. So the answers are going to be budget support to allow governments to continue to deliver services. And secondly, it, what amounts to, in effect, relief of humanitarian operations, wherever they're most needed, and also cash transfers in those countries where you can do that, because that's the quickest way to allow people to have access to the market at a time like this. Great. Now, one of the topics, uh, you know, that is very high on the agenda for African countries uh, is the debt burden that they're facing right now. And and I know this is something that, that of course, uh, you're hearing a lot of as well. Um, I'm wondering from your perch, do you think the major world lenders will be able to cooperate to ease this burden, either as a, a moratorium on payments or as debt cancellation? Of course, there's been a particular focus on China, and I'm wondering what the EU may be hearing from Chinese counterparts on on if such a debt relief will be on the table. Well, your first point is the most important. This is a complex affair because there are many, many creditors globally to whom to whom these countries of the region and of Africa are indebted. So we've got to deal. That there are the international financial institutions who seem the most ready to find somewhere flexibility to deal with the existing debts. There is then the bilateral debtors, and you've included uh, China, and there are others too, all of whom are going to have to come fairly quickly with some conclusion, because that's the big portion of the debt that exists for these countries. And then there's the private debt to, to any private sector and banks and the like. Uh, I don't see this happening overnight. What there has to be very quickly is a relief provided on the payments that have to be made on the servicing of debt right now. That is the key. If we can get a moratorium on that, it creates the fiscal space, some cushion for governments to be able to spend money on what is public services as opposed to debt service. That's the key. So we need, there are parts to this and it needs to be sequenced so that politically and economically one brings the right relief at the right time. Lifting the moratorium on debt service payments is the key now. When you look around the region, the Horn of Africa region, I'm wondering, do you see a clear regional strategy emerging or does it look like most countries are still very much, you know, responding to this on their own? It's a question one should ask globally as well. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I come and represent an mm -hmm. institution which has, has had to really shake itself to 
to arrive at a, at a, at a more institutional regional approach to deal with, with, with something that is potentially catastrophic. Now, in, in this region, probably of all the regions of Africa, you have in the Horn the least sort of a regional institution which has still a long way to go to build up the, the levels of cooperation. And that's eager. I, I see a move among all the leaders of the region to find a way of kind of, of consulting and finding that they, find, that they get a regional response. And I think that's good and should be encouraged. We, the European Union, encourage that too, I, meaning regional integration is to us part of our DNA and, 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 we, and we think it's a good thing in, in this part of the world and elsewhere. The question becomes, well, what do you move on? What's the priority you set? You can't do everything at a time like this. And I think right now, EGAD is, is looking to see what it should really prioritize. One is to check on food security. Uh, is food moving? Are the food supply chains in this region going to be affected? How are they going to be affected? Therefore, what are the types of warnings and actions that need to be uh, delivered? Two, it's, it has to do with trade at the borders. I think that is key. Uh, there's always a risk that normal trade, well managed at the frontiers, could be supplanted by illegal trade if one just simply shuts down frontiers. So that, that at a time of crisis becomes key. How, how do you move goods while you're trying to contain the movement of people for health reasons? Uh, and that is, that, is, that is a tough call, but it's one that I think EGAD's beginning to look at. That's just to give you a couple of examples of the things that are needed now. And I, and I think that the region is beginning to really look at because they appreciate what are the dangers. This is a bit tangential to our, our main topic. But since we're on the topic of EGAD, of course, the EU is a major supporter of EGAD. Um, and a lot of those answers that you had there were related to kind of economic integration. Um, and, and, you know, EGAD has taken on an increasing peace and security role in the region in recent years. And their effectiveness, you know, has been a, a matter of frustration, I think, for many, as I'm sure uh, you've heard a lot as well. I'm just wondering, do you think EGAD as it's structured right now is fit for purpose? There's a constant need for an evolution of an organization like this. Uh, we're talking about a region that even before the virus struck and its implications became so clear, was a re this was a region which was going through the most extraordinary change. Uh, we had political transitions in countries like Sudan and Ethiopia. Uh, we, we had what I would call the eruption of the younger generation into the politics as related to those transitions. And demographically, this region, we're going to see a, a tidal wave um, demographic tidal wave breaking on the political scene in the years ahead. So we've got that. How is that handled? We've got conflicts, we've got terrorism, all of which need to be brought together and a regional organization becomes all the more relevant at a time like this. So is it equal to the, the array of challenges? I think it's trying to become that need to become that because a region without some kind of regional cooperation uh, is, is going to leave itself deeply isolated and fragmented. And I say this for another strategic reason. The other parallel development we've had has been the, the emergence and, if you will, the, the, the intrusion of all sorts of foreign interests in the region in the last few years. And that is whether it's from the Gulf, you've got China, obviously we Europeans and the like have been involved. But there is this convergence to secure interests in the region. What the political implications are uh, have to be really carefully analyzed and assessed. And I think the region has to do one thing, which is to come together and decide among itself how it, how it best, protect, best protects the region from the less than scrupulous who want to come and perhaps, uh, you know, take a more predatory view or a much more transactional rather than strategic and, and well-intentioned approach to the region. Those are the challenges. Have they been met yet? By no means. Welcome to politics. 
I, I'm curious. Um, I'm wondering why you why you think that the Horn of Africa and EGAD has you know had a particularly challenging time in creating a strong uh, regional institution compared to some of the other regions in Africa. Some people you know say that it's because uh, this region lacks a sort of clear power um, and hegemon, if you will, uh, among all those countries, and there's too much, you know, parity, and so it makes it difficult to reach consensus. Do you see something sort of structural that, that makes it more difficult here, or, or do you think it's, it's more contingent factors? I, I think what you've had is a region which, unlike other regions, is historically, if you look carefully at, at the sort of the, what has preceded the current countries and governments, meaning the history, the colonial history or absence of colonial history, is so extraordinarily diverse that the legacies are so different, the political legacies in all the countries. I, I'm really struck by that. We, we've had countries, look, this is a region where you've had, in effect, two uh, agreed secessions, Eritrea and South Sudan, mm-hmm. which yeah. have come out of co- a history of deep conflict. Uh, This is a region where you have, we do have one huge country, that's Ethiopia. This is a region where several of the governments that have emerged have come out of conflict, revolution, each bringing their own ideologies. So, you know, if we put it plainly, over the last 20 years, Sudan, Ethiopia, Somalia, Kenya, I just take four examples, each of such profound historical origins and experience that it doesn't surprise me that it's been tougher to begin to produce that that sense of cohesion and common purpose that some may may want and expect and may see elsewhere. That's my approach. I take a more historical approach, and therefore I'm more patient, frankly, and I think one should be more patient when one looks at how to support a region like this, to begin slowly to come together. Now, perhaps with this virus and its impact, it may be the wake-up call that a region needs. You know, sometimes it takes a real crisis to just shake out what is relevant and what is irrelevant. And I think that's what I was trying to get at earlier. We, we yeah. may see people realize that the need for, for real cooperation becomes an absolutely essential element. Moving back again to the the pandemic and and I think very much the the global side of this, do do you worry about the geopolitics and some of the great power competition, particularly between the the U.S. and China, getting in the way of the world's ability to step in and assist this region during this crisis? Well, the level of distraction is high. What we see is the absence of any clear leadership at a time like this. Um, and I say this as someone from the European Union, where we suddenly realize that some assumptions about how the world is ordered um, don't seem to hold at the moment. Mm-hmm. So, for example, I can speak for us at the European Union. What we're doing is struggling to say, well, how do we move ourselves into the middle of the room to gather everyone round? Because there's one way we're not going to help anyone, let alone ourselves is by allowing a state of uncontrolled competition, um, vanities, and Lord knows what else to take over at a time when we need real, real cooperation. So your question is, of course, there's that fear. Yes, there's a vacuum. Those who one normally would assume would take over, not take over, but really show a lead, seem to have gone absent. And as a consequence, some of us, like the European Union, are very much of the view, let's now move and start to gather people and and see if we can come up with a common approach. Uh, Africa's, if Africa suffers, a lot of other people will suffer, and it starts with Europe. Conversely, if mm-hmm. Europe suffers more, it has an impact on Africa. Let's all start to sit down and, and find the common ground. That's, a, that's the approach we want to take and are trying to take, and at various levels, it's political, it's diplomatic, it's about economic diplomacy, it's about just straight coordination in humanitarian activity. So there are many layers at work here. 
And as you mentioned, of course, this is a global pandemic and ultimately defeating the virus, you know, will, will by its nature sort of require a global approach. I'm wondering um, how you think leaders in this region can be strategic and in engaging the rest of the world and sort of making their case for, for more assistance during these difficult times for everyone. Look, I think there's, there's, there's a good deal already being done. Uh, sometimes it's not public, but there's a lot of communication going on. Uh, I think the second thing where leaders can do, and it comes back to what you asked me earlier about the region, I mm -hmm. think it, these are moments where they need to be gathering with a frequency that really begins to build a familiarity among themselves as to what are their real priorities. You can't go, um, you can't go to the world with sort of a, a, a complete jumble of needs. Um, a, a region that shows its priorities is the region that knows where it's going, and it's a region to which people then respond um, more readily. Now, it's, not, it's easy to say this, but I would argue that the more frequently the regional heads of states meet, uh, I would welcome hearing that the, re the heads of states gather on a virtual call almost once a week. They did it two or three weeks ago. Uh, I think this needs to become more frequent. Uh, I think, secondly, there is an absolute priority to see how they, how they manage to make sure that basic supplies are, are, uh, are available. Uh, you cannot afford to have a food crisis now or in the months ahead. Third, I think a really important appeal globally that everyone understands that right now the rate of job losses in, mm -hmm. in this region a region which was beginning to show economic growth is now being set back, and, the, and, and this is going to result in serious loss of jobs. How do we make sure we fill in that gap, and how is that conveyed internationally? My worry is a simple one. Globally, people are looking at Africa and saying, they're, they're looking at the number of cases, and they mm -hmm. say, well, Africa is nothing compared to what we see in either America or we saw in China or in Europe. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's doing fine. To use the language of the ep epidemic, it is failing to understand what are some of the underlying conditions in Africa, which mm -hmm. are the relative weakness of public service, the relative weakness of the economies, the dependence of the economies on the global trading system and its utter susceptibility to the slightest weakness or jolt in that system. These, to me, are the issues that need to be conveyed. It has been done at the level of the G20 and the move to try to relieve debt, and where Prime Minister Abiy, for example, is very vocal, I think is, is, is to be applauded. Now, an infrastructure around it. It's one thing to ask for relief, let me put it that way. Then one has to say what one is going to do with it. It's not about accountability to, to the rest of the world. It's about accountability to one's own citizens, to give them a sense of, of the direction of where, where things are headed. Because there are a lot of frightened households at the moment in Africa as there are elsewhere. And that is what is missing, in my view, and needs to, need, really needs to be conveyed. I see it. I sense it. I try to convey it. I think it needs more, a more consistent voice from the leadership here. So on that topic, you know, uh, as you've talked about, there's a number of extremely fraught and fragile political transitions in the region, uh, including in Ethiopia, also in Somalia and Sudan, South Sudan. Do you fear that leaders will use this crisis for their own political advantage and possibly even bring about uh, political crises uh, related to this pandemic? Uh, look, I mean, um, in in it's not just here, we see it in mm -hmm. other places. The, the temptation to exploit a crisis of this mag magnitude for political purposes is always there. L let's look at it in another way. This crisis can either arrest transitions or it can help accelerate them in, in a mm -hmm. positive direction. Uh, this means that the management of the response of, of a transition should result in political leadership trying to get the greatest sense of conciliation and buy-in from one's whole society. If one is going to postpone elections, which is an entirely understandable thing, perhaps, then 
it does require a commensurate degree of um, communication and political communication with all the interests in the country to ensure that there, there is a degree of consensus in the way forward. Uh, this is going to be true for Ethiopia. It is true, I think, for Sudan in its own way, which is, going to be, is being hit as well. Sudan, each of them have very different set of circumstances, as you well know. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Somalia as well. Uh, if someone tries to take an exclusive approach in which, at a time of crisis, others feel that their sense of belonging is, is reduced rather than enhanced, that will end up in tears. On that topic, and and this is a a, a difficult one, I, I imagine. But you know, there are questions that if the EU does move ahead with with budgetary support to these countries, um, there are questions of whether or not that should be conditional on some political metrics, such as widening the political tent in order to sort of try to encourage more inclusive governance during this crisis. And of course, on the on the regional side, of course, that might spark concerns of, of uh, essentially meddling in their internal politics. I can certainly speak for us in the EU and, and, uh, and all my member states. Uh, the notion that we would go to our, um, our citizens and taxpayers and simply say that uh, you know, the money that's being spent is... Is, is, is being done in such a way without proper, uh, properly addressing the issues of accountability would, would be absolutely ludicrous. And that's why I think that is understood in all the countries. I think there's a second level, though. To give money as budget support to a government requires a set of agreements as to how money is governed and used in a particular country for the, and, and, and given the circumstances under which it was given. There's no way this can be seen as being conditionality or anything else. It, it is quite simply us being accountable to our own citizens. It's an issue of fiduciary responsibility, which is attached to a sense of political responsibility. You're not going to give money to governments, which then might be tempted to use the money for political purposes, rather than that of making sure that public services are delivered. Uh, that's the purpose of giving budget support. And in each country, it, it plays itself out in different ways. But, you know, what I can assure you is these discussions are going on right now as we speak with all the, with all the governments. At the end of the day, is the money being used for the purposes for which it was intended? If that's seen mm -hmm. as conditionality, I say no. It's the simple issue. It's what emerges in any contract when money is exchanged. Sure. And that's, the, and, and that's a question of sort of where the money that... Uh, is is being given to the country where it is going, and then I think that the question of conditionality then is as a condition, you know, for receiving that money. Are there certain uh, political steps that that the 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 donors would like to see the country take, you know, as you know, as a condition for the for the receiving the aid? Yeah, I think here it, it, this is a very a critical question, and I, I'd like to sort of try to see if I can face it head on. Um, here are a set of countries which were anyway before uh, this crisis hit, embarked on a series of reforms of varying degrees of significance. Uh, and, you know, we call them transitions. Now, money that is given for budget support, and, and including if we get to debt relief issues, um, one has to assume is going to, is going to be given and it would be accepted on the principle and in the spirit that it is to encourage the very transition upon which these, these countries were embarked. If there's a sense that this results in or, uh, is the crisis as a camouflage for a regression, then I suspect that there will be many people who think twice about what is the, why is the money being given, to what end, in which case just run a simple uh, humanitarian operation and keep people alive if the governments are not going to address their own responsibilities. Now, I also want to ask on Sudan particularly, uh, because, of course, the, the, you know, the, the Sunnis transition is still incredibly fragile. Uh, when this sort of power-sharing arrangement between the military and the civilians were signed last year, 
there is a lot of promises, implicit or explicit, that there'd be significant international sort of financial assistance um, to support the transition. Um, and, and to a large degree, that really hasn't come to fruition yet. Uh, do you think the world is letting Sudan down? Well, we better hurry up and get our act together if Sudanese don't start thinking that we are letting them down. There's absolutely no doubt that Sudan finds itself trapped between conditions, legal conditions set on Sudan that you know, have, have yet to be lifted. We have donors who expect a degree of reform on Sudan in order to feel that the the investment is going to help. And then you have others who come not from, let's say, Europe or or the United States, who clearly want to get involved, want to help, but may may be unclear as to where where the, um, the, the future lies politically. So if you have a transition, and there's a three-year period, the end state should be something that is democratic, run by civilians, and during which period there's been a considerable reform as to who controls the money, uh, how it is spent, and, and how one um, reorganizes the many, the, the, this, this um, strange security setup of multiple militias as well as a military. Mm-hmm. These have direct in- uh, impact on, on the way an economy is run. It seems to me there are two or three things that are needed. Uh, First, even though there may be legal restrictions on lending money from the international financial institutions, I think it would be encouraging if they were to engage and use certain grant mechanisms to help give a boost to Sudan. Sudan right now needs a safety net just simply Mm -hmm. to survive. The, the international financial institutions, along with other donors, I think need to pitch in and pretty fast. And there's going to be a, a virtual meeting in, um, organized by the European Union and Germany and the UN in, in late June on that. Second, <clears throat> I think there needs to be a more consistent conversation with uh, countries in the Gulf who have a very direct interest in Sudan to see how they can perhaps contribute to a process that, um, on which we all agree. Third, there is Sudan itself, where there are delicate political decisions that have to be made about how, who controls what money and how basically you turn Sudan from being a country which has the lowest tax base anywhere. It raises the lowest taxes anywhere. Um, to becoming one where revenue that does exist in the country can be properly mobilized to, to support the government and support the, the, you know, the, the, the services that a government um, has to provide. So I see those as three essential elements where some serious conversation is needed right now. What do you think is the main factor and in, in why sort of this sort of coordinated financial assistance has taken so long uh, coming from the world. Is it, is it, how much of it is related to the, the state sponsor of terror designation from Washington, or is this just more an issue of, of it not being a big enough priority on the international scene? I, I think Sudan's changes came at a time when there were other changes going on in the region. Mm-hmm. I think secondly, th- there's been if I may put it this way, when you look at the scale and the significance of what has occurred with Ethiopia and Sudan almost simultaneously, I mean, it's an extraordinary thing that the Horn of Africa, mm-hmm. which has in the past been emblematic of all that, is, that doesn't work, has mm-hmm. produced the type of changes which, which are of a scale, as far as I'm concerned, politically equal to what happened in 1989-1990 in Europe. That's the significance of the type of walls that have brought, been brought down. Now, it, I think we all collectively, globally, have to ask ourselves, have we, have we responded to these politically and financially to help bridge this transition in a way commensurate and at a scale that is, and a speed that is commensurate to the, the sheer challenge of what the citizens of these countries have taken on? 
And I would, I would argue, uh, and I have to admit, that I feel we have fallen somewhat short. It's not too late. There's a lot that can be done. But I think there's an urgency. And this crisis and this epidemic, this pandemic, I think has helped to concentrate minds to realize what is truly at risk now. And that, that's the way I'd be looking at it. And I do look at it that way. Zooming a bit ahead again and, and sort of widening the lens once more, I'm wondering what sort of a world do you think this region will be facing in the years to come and how it will be different than, than what was already there? The region's going to have to look at itself first to work out how then it analyzes the world outside. I mm -hmm. fear the world outside may be talking. Will the world outside be less or more predatory? Will it be more fragmented or more united in how it deals things? It's about multilateralism as opposed to the collapse of multilateralism. There are big questions like that. The region itself, I, I sense that it's going, there's going to be a very interesting discussion that emerges about the centrality of the state, the role of government. How effective has it been? Has it been revealed to be inadequate or adequate? What is the role that the state is going to play? What is the definition of security? When today we realize that security is about health as opposed to just simply a threat, a, a physical threat of terrorism or whatever else. I, I think these debates are going to emerge and, and they're healthy ones to be raised. Regarding the world uh, the, the region faces, I, I think if I were the region, I'd be asking myself, how come we seem so exposed? Let me just put it this way, when the international system, a trading system, just has twitches sli slightly, um, the, the effects can be economically lethal and mortal to a region like this. I, I'd like to imagine that the region would begin to ask itself how it reduces that dependence externally. Uh, you have to look at the demographics of a region. How does the majority of this region, who are young, view the way their own, that they have been governed and how they will be governed in a world that is, that is somewhat unpredictable? And at the end of the day, um, I can't predict what the world's going to look like. I think, uh, just as we couldn't predict what the, this corona uh, and this virus mm -hmm. in the way we perhaps should have, had we paid more attention to public health as opposed to just simply the protection of certain people's public purse. Now, uh, Ambassador, one, one final question. Uh, you know, this seems to be a very busy time for, for diplomats such as yourself. I'm, I'm out of curiosity... I'm wondering what percentage of time you basically spend worrying or preparing for, you know, the actual pandemic and the disease itself and the public health preparedness versus these other, you know, downstream uh, worries that we've discussed, uh, a possible humanitarian crisis and hunger crisis, uh, political crises that could emerge. Wh wh you know, what ends up taking up most of your time these days? Uh, for me personally, it is... One is trying to encourage my own, um, those to whom I answer, which is the member states of the European Union, to be aware of what is the depth of what is occurring and the extent of it, and thus the scale and the speed with which one has to respond. That's one. Mm -hmm. Second, um, you know, one has to divide up some, you know, responsibilities and priorities. Now, in my case... I am concerned about looking downstream because if, if that is not being done, we're going to be hit by a sort of a machine gun of, un, of what should be anticipated but become a surprise. How do we deal with the locusts? How do we deal with the breakdown in food supplies? How do we deal with making sure that schools can stay open? We can go through all these questions. And my sense is, the, those who are expert at delivering the medical support and health support know what they have to do and are gearing up. What's needed now is to make sure that there, is sufficient, there are sufficient resources that come in from all, you know, globally in a coordinated way to keep governments alive and ticking so that they can 
provide for the future. But secondly, to make absolutely clear that households don't despair. I mean, if people start feeling that they can't put a square meal on the table because they've lost their income, then you enter an entirely new realm. And that is the work of the moment. It is to mobilize, to make sure that the type of assistance that's needed arrives on time and to the right place. And that's more than just saying an efficient humanitarian exercise. It's a highly political one too. Thanks, Ambassador, for, for coming on our podcast and, uh, and for such a wide-ranging discussion. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening and for bearing with us as we record from our homes. As always, if you would like to find out more about Crisis Group or read our reports, you can find us at crisisgroup.org. I'm Alan Boswell, and this episode was produced by Maeve Francis. 